Hi everyone, I'm David Gregg. This week on Hashtag Natural History Tuesday, we're going to talk about this new book, The Dragonflies and Damselflies of Rhode Island, by Virginia A. Brown, with illustrations by Nina Briggs. This is just out from the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management Division of Fish and Wildlife, and it's a book that the Natural History Survey has been involved with for nearly 20 years. It's got a lot of cool features I want to show you, and I also interviewed the author, Ginger Brown, and we'll show you a bit of that. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. So what have we got in the book here? Well, there are several sections. Uh, the first one is actually a intro an introduction to the Odinata Atlas of Rhode Island project. Um, it talks about uh, why that project came about and uh, the methodologies that were used, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in the interview. The next section on methods includes a really useful summary of the uh, dragonfly and damselfly habitats in Rhode Island. So you've got, uh, you've got lentic habitats, ponds, and it talks a little bit about that. Man-made ponds and lakes, bogs and fens, with some really nice illustrations. Upland and terrestrial habitats talks about the importance of uh, those kinds of habitats for Odinata. It's got some information on species richness of different sites. Uh, it's got uh, a little section on the conservation of Odinata and what the threats are to the Odinate diversity in Rhode Island. And then it has uh, some really nice breakdowns of the distribution and abundance by species. So uh, for each species you can see uh, the number of counties it's found in, number of towns, number of sites. And then uh, in Rhode Island, whether it's ubiquitous and abundant or widespread and uncommon, uh, so one uh, characterization of how broadly uh, it, across Rhode Island it's distributed and the other how frequently encountered it is essentially wherever it is that you find it. So each species uh, has a spread that looks like this. It starts with a, a summary of the statistics on the species, uh, a terrific uh, color illustration by Nina Briggs, a description of the species, habitat characteristics, range and local distribution, flight data, because seasonality is important for uh, a lot of the odes, and then some notes. The notes section of each species is one of my favorite parts of the book, and I think one of its greatest contributions to odinate understanding in, in general. So uh, here's a passage from the notes section for fawn darner. The flight behavior of fawn darners is so peculiar that they can sometimes be identified by this characteristic alone. Adults of both sexes fly along stream banks just above water, not in a straight line or particularly fast, but rather casually, as if inspecting every angle of the bank. They slip beneath the overhanging earth in places and fly around every branch, every snag, log, rock, or biologist waiting in the stream. Here's the notes section for the mocha emerald. Although frequently observed foraging in open sun in fields and along field and forest edges, the mocha emerald is a dragonfly of shady streams. Streams in which it occurs are dark and dappled with sunlight. When numerous mocha emeralds are patrolling, the air above the water is alive with their dark, ghostly forms and sparkling green eyes. But that's enough for me. Let's hear from the author herself, Virginia Ginger Brown, who I interviewed a few weeks ago. Don't go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Ginger Brown, and I've been uh, working, studying dragonflies and damselflies for a long time, since about 1980. Um, and I started, I guess I started to get interested in insects when I was in college, um, but I've always been interested in wildlife biology. And when I was growing up and right through, you know, like high school years, I wanted to work on big charismatic animals in Africa, like lions and elephants and things like that. And so I ended up working on the smallest things 
and focusing on insects and um, dragonflies and damselflies in particular. Um, I started inventorying on Cape Cod and um, really was looking for some damselflies that hadn't been seen for a while. And so that kind of got me, got my feet wet, I guess. And at the, uh -huh. end of about, yeah, at the end of about 10 years working on Cape Cod, I, I wrote the Dragonflies and Damselflies of Cape Cod, which is a, a field guide type book. Um, and then in 1990, I moved to Rhode Island uh, to work for the Nature Conservancy and um, started, we had, some, we had some work done in particular um, watersheds and focused on particular insect species, uh, dragonfly species. Um, and we were trying to work on, you know, making statements about a particular watershed, that it was the best place to go to look for aquatic invertebrates and things like that. But we didn't have a lot of data from the other parts of Rhode Island and the other watersheds. And so that's when we uh, started the Rhode Island Oden Data Atlas. And that was really the point was to get data from all over Rhode Island so that we could actually say something about a particular watershed and have something to compare it to. So it, that's how that started. It, it's kind of funny that um, you really just wanted to be able to say a simple sentence. This place is the best place. And then look what happened, right? So what right. is this? It, 30 years later or something so yeah I mean and it really makes sense and at the time you know there was a lot of interest in in aquatic invertebrates and using aquatic invertebrates to um to measure the health of a watershed um and you know odinates dragonflies and damselflies are really um good indicators of that and particularly some groups and so it really made sense to look in a more broad place um and, and it was great it was a really fun thing to do and it, it, yeah it was, we got a lot of data so so uh, kind of related to that, I had a question about um, how did you decide to do a um, an all over the state, every site you can get to Atlas versus, let's say, Sentinel sites and just pick, uh, um, I don't know, one site in every you know county or something like that. Um, how did you decide on the methodology, the particular methodology you were going to follow for the Atlas? Well, I, I consulted with um, the two biologists who did the uh, bird, breeding bird atlas, which was Rick Enser and Chris Rachel. Um, and they helped a lot in sort of thinking about methodology. But um, I really wanted to get as much data from as many different places in Rhode Island because it seemed like it made the most sense. And, you know, it was not just to learn what was there, what species were around, but it was to find places that maybe we didn't know about that had particular species richness or diversity or both or uh, species of conservation interest. Um, so that was the reason for it. And picking one site um, wouldn't, wouldn't help us cross the um, variety of habitats that are available as well. So like if we chose one site in each town, it wouldn't be enough to get us all the habitats we wanted to sample. So we wanted to look at all the different habitats all across the state. Okay. Right. And, and you don't really know what you don't know at the start. Like you might think you know the important habitats, but what if you don't? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, a big um, a big vehicle for discovery, too, is what a project like that is, you know, to yeah. discover new places. Um, I mean, I went to places in Rhode Island, beautiful places that I had no idea existed during that project. And so that was one of the things that I really loved the best about it was getting to these beautiful places in Rhode Island and seeing them, you know, getting up to my knees in muck and I never, I never knew they were there before in this state. Yeah. So once you decided that your methodology was going to be to try to get as broad a picture as possible, did that, that pushed you into sort of the volunteer um, uh, direction because you were going to need a ton of people all over the place? Is that how you ended up with, with basically the, the, the volunteer Atlas team? Yeah, I, I, I knew even though Rhode Island is a really small state, I really knew that we, we were going to need extra um, manpower, extra people power, I should say. Um, yeah. I, of course, was, I was working full time at, in other things in science and stewardship at the time for the Nature Conservancy. So I couldn't do it by myself. I didn't have the time to do that because I had other duties in my job. So we knew right away we were going to need volunteers. Now, I had no idea how many volunteers we would get. You know, we put out, I, I think in, in the Natural History Survey newsletter, we put out a little announcement and, and in various publications like that. So I had no idea how many volunteers would come forward. 
Um, and that was another thing that was amazing is how many people came forward. I mean, there's there were over the course of the project, which was um, like six and a half seasons, basically, um, there were over 70 volunteers that participated in one way or another, many of those in the field. Um, so yeah, it was totally necessary to have that, that army of people out there in the water. Right. And one of the things that really uh, reflects the the scale and uh, scope of the project is the change in the number of species known from Rhode Island and kind of the understanding of Rhode Island's role in sort of species range. So where did you start at the start of the atlas and where did you end up, you know, sort of, I don't know, in your own words, how, how, how far is that distance from where we started to where you got in the end of this project? So in terms of the number of species? The number of species and also just how we understand Rhode Island's place in the in the world. Yeah, I mean, there were there were a lot of things that we learned during the atlas that we really we didn't expect in terms of species ranges. Um, we we added 22 species to our our fauna in Rhode Island during the atlas project. And many of those were found by volunteers. Um, not which, which is which is sorry it's, a, it's about 20 percent increase something yeah. like that yeah something yeah maybe a little bit under 20 percent. little we under 39 species now so it was yep. we had right you know right around 110 or something before that um yep. and you know the, you know the question with a lot of those some some of those were in habitats that just hadn't been in the sample before and so those those new species aren't necessarily rare, and some of them turned out to be quite common. It's just that nobody looked in those places because we were focusing on you know, that one, one watershed and that one type of habitat and that one group of species in that watershed. So, so that was one of the real benefits of it. Um, the other thing that we found is that we found uh, a number of Southern species that um, hadn't been reported either in Rhode Island or in New England before, which was really pretty exciting. Um, and so there were some fairly extensive there were some range expansions of those species based on what we found. And in fact, one, I mean, I can give you a perfect example. This one is still making me, you know, shake my head. <laughs> um, it, we discovered just recently in 2016 that we have specimens in our collection from that were collected during the Atlas of a species of river cruiser, Allegheny river cruiser, that was not previously known from Rhode Island or New England, and it was first, um, my colleague in Connecticut found some in, in their collection, and that made us revisit our collection. And the story with the species is, is sort of interesting, and it's sort of fun to tell, because um, I remember Nina and I having lots of discussions about these swift river cruisers that were coming in that had um, a lot of variability in pattern and size. And you know, we were kind of going, well, there's only one river cruiser here, and there's no other river cruiser near us, so, you know, <laughs> So we just, we made this assumption, and, and this is one of the lessons that the Atlas taught me was never make assumptions. <laughs> and then when we revisited those specimens, we, we discovered that they actually are Allegheny River cruisers. And the nearest um, location for that species to us at the time that we were looking at our specimens was like halfway down New Jersey, right? So not something that we would have expected to find here at all. So that was a, that was a great lesson that this project taught is you know don't make assumptions but we but prior to that you know we had found all these other southern species here that were sort of out of range if you will um but so that but that one really that one really shook me you know that was yeah. a lesson <laughs> so that brings uh, up a question that i had actually about one of the features in the book which is the the table of species of conservation interest mm -hmm. and I, if my count is correct you have 25 species in that table um, 16 of which are state listed. There are nine there that have um, a conservation interest that, but are not state listed. And there are reasons why the, the state animal list is a little out of date. That's probably one of the reasons. But uh, my question is, uh, so speaking about dragonflies and damselflies, what are the conservation concerns and threats that you're looking at when you put together this, this table of 25 species that are of concern? Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, a good portion of those were already on the existing state list, which is quite old. And one of the things I want to do in the next couple of years is, is try to you know, update that based on what we learned in the Atlas. 
Um, and we're also going to be doing some follow-up surveys on some of those species. Um, there are also the, uh, the, on that list are the species of greatest conservation need, which were um, which are from the state's wildlife action plan. Um, and I work closely with the state on those, and those were chosen um, for various reasons. Um, you know, just based on uh, how many populations we have of them, the um, overall threats to the habitats that are there. Um, in terms of odonates and threats, um, we look at upland development as one of the biggest threats. Um, and that might make you shake your head a little bit, but we know that uplands in, in forests in particular have a profound effect on aquatic habitats. Um, and forests, they buffer the habitat, they protect the water quality, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they also serve as a very important and critical part of, of adult odonate life, their habitat. Um, right. And so that's the other half of the equation. And when we looked at, um, from a town perspective, when we looked at where the highest species richnesses were, um, we found that towns and, and actually at the subwatershed level, this worked as well, those places had the most forest and the least development and roads. Um, and those were what we think are pretty solid relationships um, there. And we used the data that we had through the Atlas period only. So the recent surveys that we have done weren't included in there, but I feel fairly confident that that would, that would hold up. So development is a big one, um, but there's all kinds of other, you know, we have to look at climate change um, as, a, as a threat, especially I think to um, our coastal species. You know, species, we, ha we don't have many. There's only four odonates that occur or prefer, I should say, um, uh, brackish or salt habitats on the coast. So the question with those is, you know, in a de developed coastline, as sea level rises, what's going to happen to those habitats and thus what's going to happen to those species? Um, we yeah. also consider threats of um, recreation. Um, and in some parts of uh, the Northeast, and in, in, with some species that threat may be larger than in others. Um, so, um, you know, even fishing bank destabilization, um, creating access for fishing and, um, and other recreational activities, off-road vehicles um, in, in uh, protected lands and around wetlands and things like that. What do we not, what do we still not know or what questions um, did you come away from the atlas with that you want to investigate some more? Good question. So for me, the biggest thing right now is that most of our records are now old, right? So there, if you go back to the atlas from 1998 to 2004, that's when a lot of our records were generated. And I did some work here in the late 1980s on those Northeast endemic damselflies. So there's some records from the late 80s. And then there's some from after the atlas. But by far, our records are now at best, you know, 15, 10, 15 or older, 15 years older. Um, uh, and so it's time to relook at a lot of those things, especially those species that we consider of conservation interest. So focusing on those species on that list there. Um, but there's also, you know, there's lots of other questions about, um, you know, range expansion in some of these species. Um, when we relook at them, and I can give you an example of that. In 2018 and 2019, a group of, um, of people in the Northeast, people like me who are odonate specialists, um, including like the state um, agencies, um, got together and decided to focus on those Northeast endemic damselflies throughout their range. So it's, it's a working group of sorts. And, and so we spent two years revisiting our records, our old records, going back to these places to see if the, if the species were still there. Um, here, when we when we did it, um, it left me a little bit concerned about that period of time that we left between our last you know records of those species and when we caught up with them again in 2018 and 2019. And it appears that we had substantial population loss over that period of time. So um, I'm estimating of of the four species that we looked at, I'm estimating around 15 to 20 percent population loss maybe a little higher in some species. Um, and, and it left me scratching my head, you know, because I would go to these places in 2018 and 2019 and they looked exactly like they should, you know, the habitat looked perfect, but no analagmas, no, no bluets that were there. 
And so, you know, I, I was puzzled about it for a while. So that was a big question. And, and I know that question wasn't generated by the Atlas, but all the data that we were looking at. Yeah. Then, well, it was, it was in a way because you couldn't even have, there would have been no hope of answering it without the Atlas. The Atlas is that stake in the ground That's right. that you can measure from. That's right. And, and so with many of those lost populations, when I started hearing from locals, and one of those locals is Charlie, who had some knowledge of what might have happened in those places, um, I discovered that a lot of them had had, um, they even had dam breaks due to flooding rains. You remember the floods in 2010? 2010, yeah. So a lot of dam breaks, even, you know, natural dams like beaver dams that were holding ponds back that were habitat were broken. And also there were some where there were uh, drawdowns to allow for water control devices or um, um, upkeeping on dams or dam actually repair, build yeah. dam repairs. Dam. Yeah. So that makes perfect sense. You know, you blow a hole in those ponds and there goes the habitat down the drain, right? So if their larvae are in there, they're gone too. Um, so that made total sense. And when I, I also worked on those species in, on Long Island, in 2019 for the same project. And we had the same, we had large population loss down there. Now I'm not a local down there, so I don't know what happened, but all those habitats, um, you know, look like they should have supported those species as well. As well. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just one example of something that's left me totally puzzled. So I need to, we need to go back and, and follow up on that, you know, and try to figure out, because if you don't see the population there for two years, that doesn't mean it's not gonna come back again. Um, there's a possibility that if there's another population close enough, it could be recolonized. So that's one thing that I think we want to look at um, right. there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I do want to also acknowledge the Department of Environmental Management, Fish and Wildlife for taking this project on um, because, you know, they took it on without any affiliation to their agency at all. You know, I'm not a, an employee or anything. It never was. So um, I totally appreciate that. And I'm grateful to them for taking it on because that's why the book is here. Um, yeah. But Nina was um, an, a, an employee during the Atlas period and she uh, worked in the field. She's a, a taxonomist as well as an artist. Um, and she worked in the field and she also was the person who uh, did the identification of specimens after we put our nets away. So long after the nets were in the closet for the season, she spent several months going through all the specimens that had come in from the volunteers um, and me and identifying them and getting those ready to go into the collection. Um, so, and, and in addition, again, as I said, to being a, a bio talented biologist, she is, as you know, a talented artist. And um, I, I wanted Nita to do the illustrations because um, not only is she an artist, but she knows the bugs themselves, right? And I think that that completely helps to get an accurate um, illustration on the page to have that knowledge. So, and Nina and I are good friends. We've been friends for many, many years, even before the Atlas. Um, I had I had, had hired her to do some uh, target work on damselflies um, when I was with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so she was a contractor for us um, for a couple of seasons on that. Yeah. Um, well, it's so rare that um, a project like this, a project gets done on this scale, um, that it you, you projects that get done on this scale become enormously valuable over time just because they are so rare. It's mm -hmm. so. Uh, unusual for someone to have the opportunity to spend the years that you did on this, to have the volunteers, to be doing a taxa that was, you know, complicated enough to provide a, a fine grained picture of the environment, but not so difficult to work with that you, you couldn't find people who were willing to learn it and do it. Um, I think, the I think this will continue to gain value over time because because it's so rare that something like this gets produced. Um, yeah, thank you for saying that. And one of the things I do want to say is that, you know, as a biologist, and you probably feel the same way, I think it's very important that we learn what species are occurring in these places now because these places are being destroyed and, um, uh, you know, habitats are being lost and degraded 
And we need to know what's there. And so that's one of the big functions of this project and the data that came out of it is, as you po correctly point out, it serves as that foundation. So we know at that one window in time between 1998 and 2004, these things occurred in these places. Um, and so when we, somebody goes back, it won't be me, 50 years from now, when somebody goes back, you know, they'll have that baseline that they can compare current conditions to. Yep. Yep. Super. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you so cool. much for having me. It's great talking to you. Yeah, really nice to see you and best to Charlie and we'll talk thank to you again soon. All right. Thank you, David. Well, there you go. A review of the Dragonflies and Damselflies of Rhode Island by Virginia A. Brown, uh, published this year by Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Uh, you can get your copy for just $25 from Rhode Island DEM, and I'll put a link down below to their information so that you can, you can get your copy. I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you find some great Odinates out there this season, and we'll catch you next time on hashtag Natural History Tuesday. Natural History Survey videos are made possible through the generous contributions of members and friends. Want to help us do more environmental science and conservation? Hit the like button, share our videos with your circle, subscribe, or make a financial contribution on our website, ranhs.org, or through Patreon. Thanks, and see you out there.